But of course, if you have this flow of water all the time into this area, there must go some out also. And a part of that comes in the surface on both sides of Greenland, but most of the inflow actually sinks in the Nordic seas and partly on the Arctic shelves. It sinks because it's being cooled. When you cool seawater, the air cools the seawater in the surface, it becomes colder and therefore denser, gets a higher density. And so, in some regions in the Nordic seas and on the Arctic shelves, it sinks and fills up the bathtub with very cold water. And since this goes on regularly, the bathtub flows over and we get an overflow of cold water back into the Atlantic Ocean. The cold water goes at depth through the deep channels that are crossing this ridge. So, and this is a very important point, the cooling by air of the seawater partly produces this deep overflow water, which I will show in a little while, is very important globally, and partly also sucks in warm water that keeps our climate mild. It's like a giant pump, often called the cold heart of the ocean. But let us look a bit more on this overflow, this flow of cold water going into the Atlantic. It starts up here, but when it gets into the Atlantic, it's very dense, and so it sinks to great depths, three, 4,000 meter depth. It passes all the way south through the Atlantic, circles around the globe, and sends branches into the Indian and Pacific Ocean. This is a process that takes a long time, 500, maybe 1,000 years or more. But on the way, the water is slowly rising. We're talking about a few meters a year, perhaps. But eventually, it gets back to the surface where it's warmed, and then it returns. Perhaps not exactly like the arrows I've shown here, but it has to return to where it sank originally, or where water is sinking. So we have this more or less closed loop, like a giant conveyor belt, transport bunt, and that's what it's been called, the great conveyor belt of the ocean. It's also called the MOC, Meridional Overturning Circulation, or the THC, Thermal Ion Circulation. The point is that there are very few regions in the world where water is sinking. We have it north of us in this area. It is in the Labrador Sea, but not as important as the one north of us. And we have a f two uh, small sources in the Antarctic. But these are the only areas where water sinks to large depths. And therefore, these are the only areas that really replenish, put new water into the deep ocean. And then comes the point of cooling. Because, as I said, well, of course, there are many different processes that can affect this circulation. But if you do not have cooling at high latitudes, then you will not have this circulation. Or at least it will be reduced. And here comes climate change in, because with climate change, the air at high latitudes will become warmer. Actually, we expect the Arctic regions to, to warm much more than most of the rest of the world. So the cooling, well, it will not stop, but it will be reduced. That's fairly certain. And so there has been concern that this pump could slow down, which might lead to regional cooling, perhaps. Now, this has given rise to a lot of media debate, even to a Hollywood blockbuster like this one, The Day After Tomorrow. It's a very nice, nice action movie where uh, they imagine this process to initiate a, a, an ice age within a couple of weeks. 
Now, as I said, it's a nice action movie, but it's got nothing to do with reality. We are not going to have an ice age in this century. That is, I think, very certain. But the meridional overturning circulation, the great conveyor belt of the ocean, will most probably slow down in this century. That is the conclusion by the last report of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the, the you can say, the, the most authoritative council on climate established by a group of experts within the United Nations framework. They find it very likely that the North Atlantic MOC will slow down during this century. But uh, the estimates disagree on how much. Perhaps we can say that it seems to indicate that about one-third less. So what will be the consequences of that? Well, as I said, the MOC has water sinking at high latitudes and then flowing through the deep ocean. And when it does that, and that's why it's called a conveyor belt, it takes things along with it. When the water is in contact with the atmosphere, it absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And then it transports that into the deep ocean. So that's why we don't have one reason that we don't have that much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And it takes heat from the atmosphere and puts it into the deep ocean, fortunately. But there are other things, like oxygen which the water gets when it's in contact with the atmosphere and puts into the deep ocean. And that's important because all animals, all fish and other animals, have to breathe. And when they breathe, they take oxygen out of the water. So as the water flows through the deep ocean, it has less and less oxygen. And there are some regions in the Pacific where there is almost no oxygen left. So it's quite clear that a change in this system could have severe consequences, although I should say this is on long time scales. It's not something that will happen tomorrow. There's a further consequence of this. When you have lots of water sinking in some areas, it has to rise somewhere else. It can't just disappear at depth. And it rises over most of the ocean, wide areas. And so the conveyor belt also conveys things from the depths upwards. And one of the most important things it conveys are what we call nutrients. Um, it's substances similar to the fertilizers that you put on your lawn. They are necessary for plants to grow. And plants are necessary for all other life. So if the plants, which have to be in the surface, because that's where the light is, if they didn't get nutrients from below, we wouldn't have plants grow, we wouldn't have very much life in the ocean. So this can also be impacted by a change in the thermal line circulation, or the MOC, but again, it's on long time scales. So if we now know that it's most likely that this circulation will change and that this will have large consequences. We could ask ourselves, has this already started? And there's been quite a lot of debate on that. You may remember that there were two contributions. We have the overflow from the region north of us, from the Nordic seas, and we have the contribution from the Labrador Sea. Now, if we look at the overflow from the Nordic Seas, 